Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our investing podcast. Our guest today is the famous US financial educator, Paul Mayman, who has more than 50 years of experience in wealth management mm. and investing. He has founded Mayman fee-only advisory firm in 1983, when I suppose most of you weren't born yet, advising clients on matters like investment planning, taxes, estate planning, insurance and risk management, based on academic research and objective data rather than emotions, forecasts, or speculation. Those of you who have already read my Beginner's Guide in Investing should remember that I've also recommended Paul Merriman's Sound Investing Podcast for every stage in life as a great educational resources, resource, especially for young investors. Paul has also recently published a new ebook named We're Talking Millions, 12 Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement, which you may find available to read for free in PDF format in the video description below. Paul, let's begin discussing your new ebook, which should be extremely helpful for young investors who want to plan their retirement. Well, it is it is the best that I know about investing successfully over the long term. And by the way, Victor, I I, I must confess, I have not read that book that you've written. So I'm going to read that, I promise. And uh, and and it, see see if we agree, but. What I believe is there are only a very few things you need to do right to be a successful investor, truly. And a dozen is probably 90%, if not 99% of what will make the difference. Now, remember, I am speaking through the eyes of using investing in the U.S. I do not know investing in Romania, so I want to apologize that I don't know all of the ins and outs there. But here, what I do know is that there are these very simple steps. They're so obvious that when you hear them, you say, yeah, I know that, and I know that. And by the time we get through the 12, you probably know at least 10 of the 12. And then my question, if I were sitting with you, talking with you about your investments, well, I'd want to see if you were doing those 10 things that you know you should, because a lot of people give lip service to certain things like, I believe in buy and hold. Yeah, you believe in buy and hold, but you act like a market timer. I mean, there are a lot of those kinds of things we have to belly up to the bar and be honest about. Are we doing what we believe? And these are the 12 things that I believe any investor should do. Now, in one particular case, it may be that you don't have the ability to use a target date fund. Amazing investment for, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest investment invention, if you want to call it that, in our industry. But other than that, I really believe that that most of the items are going to be very similar. And I do make it free. And the reason I make it free to you, and and Victor, thank you for putting that in, in the show notes, is my hope is this. You'll take that PDF and you'll send it to your nieces and your nephews and your aunts and your uncles. I would like to help everybody do better with their investments. And these are the steps. And I don't know how much you want to talk about them, Victor. I'm going to leave that to you. But these are the most important ones. I have prepared some questions which cover the most important lessons you teach us from your book and most of the chapters there. I know that you are a huge supporter of the FIRE movement, which is increasingly popular among teenagers. Your motto is invest wisely and live fully. Most young people enjoy living their lives using the motto YOLO, you only live once. Why should a young person save more and not spend more if he wants to live better? Well, let me first challenge those young people because I absolutely agree with you only live once. But having said that, when I go back and examine my life, that one trip I took was not what I would have expected. And a lot of the mistakes I made 
were really because I was following my heart instead of my head. As for example, getting married when I was 19. I mean, really think about that. Who would do that? I did, and I'm glad I did. I ended up having my first child when I was 21, and and now I'm a grandparent, and I could be a great-grandparent before I die. So there are some benefits of getting married young, but my whole life is a series of opportunities and mistakes, and I'm not shy about sharing both the things that worked and didn't work, but this whole idea of you only live once, right on, but remember, you're going to live at 21 and 31 and 41 and 51 and 61, and by the way, I never thought I'd make 71, but here I am. I'm 77, then there's 81 and 91, and for a lot of people, 101. And you can just pretend like the only living once is today. That's fine. But I'm telling you that there are huge rewards for those who know balance. The balance of thinking about the long term, and it doesn't take much when you're young to do the right thing and to make sure that you enjoy the short term. But I want you to remember one thing about that term. You only live once. Let me tell you, who wants you to remember that term. This is the most common quote, at least in the English language. This is a big deal. I can tell you that the auto manufacturers want you to know that quote. The people who are trying to get you to buy the right clothes, everybody who wants your money to transfer from your pocket to theirs wants you to remember, you only live once, do it now. They even say, you only live once, eat, dessert first. Got it? I mean, everything is about making yourself feel better. And let me guarantee you, you young people, I'll guarantee this. I'll be dead before you're going to know if the guarantee is any good. But most of us, when we're young, we are that way. But as we age and mature, we learn a different way to be, which means we don't just focus on ourselves. We focus on the world, how we might help the world. For some, In some people's cases, it's what they do in their small town, and they help people. I work for a small town. I have about 30,000 subscribers. I grew up in a little town that was not, not that big, but almost that big. And so I work for a little town, and I feel proud to help this small group of people. You will likely feel proud of the group. Well, like Victor, that's what you're doing. You told me about investing in Romania. 50% of the people in the U.S. invest. I think I read 6%. 6% in Romania invest in the market. So you're even working with... Pardon? Less than 1%. <laughs> well, that may include the newborn children, but <laughs> but that is a very big difference between where I'm working and where you're working. Yeah, unfortunately, because you said this, in Romania, most young people consider that the stock market is very volatile and risky, and they prefer to buy dozens of real estate apartments on credit and rent them. They heard this strategy from a guru called uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki. And I wanted to ask you, how dangerous do you think it is to use leverage to reach your financial goals? Oh, I think it's wonderful. I don't particularly approve of Robert Kiyosaki. I have never personally liked his work. This is not the time to discuss that. But I, I, I do think that he encourages a lot of people to go way beyond what they're prepared to do. But I think when it comes to running a business, leverage can be very good. I took, when I was 40, I was not considered a fire person. Nobody talked about the fire movement at that point. But I retired when I was 40. And I took $15,000 and I borrowed $300,000. Does this sound familiar? Like buying a piece of property. Uh, some, some, but it wasn't real estate. I was starting a business. And if I had taken that same $15,000 and purchased a building as a down payment, uh, that would have been a business. That is not passive investing. 
So what did I do with my 15,000? I started an investment advisory firm and that grew for 30 years. And like the real estate industry, it's not as liquid. You can't get in and out and trade the, the, like you can in the stock market, which I don't advise anyway. But after 30 years, the compound rate of return on that $15,000 investment was over 30%. Now, that's a really good rate of return, but it was highly leveraged. And, and so there was a high likelihood that things could have gone against me. If I had walked in in the early days of that business, just like with real estate, if I'm leveraged to the hilt and the market turns and heads down, you know, when you got a lot of leverage, you, you can go out of business. One of the most favorite, f- famous cases of all was long-term capital management. They had a billion dollars. They borrowed a hundred billion dollars and the market went against them in essence, 1%. And guess what? They're out. They're gone. They're finished. And they were run by some of the smartest people in, in the industry. So leverage can be great and it can be a monster that will make you start over. What I believe is that at the same time as I was using the leverage to build my business, like you would build apartment houses or anything else. I also kept putting money into my retirement fund because I wasn't sure those leverage things were going to work out. So that was what I did. I kept the balance. Just like today at 77, I'm half in stocks and half in bonds. Balanced. That's great, Paul. One of your chapters from your book, We're talking millions, millions, 12 ways to supercharge your retirement addresses the question every young investor has. When is the best time to invest? Can you tell us why is it so important to start earlier to invest than later? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons, uh, Victor. One is just creating a habit. Uh, I really wish, and I'm, I'm serious here, because I have lost over 4,000 pounds on diets since I was in, well, my late teenager years. I have been on a diet for all of these years. I've lost so much weight. I'm still 30 pounds overweight. So what did I learn? I did not learn the right habits early. I learned the wrong habits. I learned that eating was a way to celebrate and eating was a way to, if you've got troubles, eat when you have troubles, eat when you're doing well. Any any excuse to eat, bad habit. Same with investing. If you even start with a few dollars, I'm working on on a podcast and an article uh, right now about starting with $40 as a 20 year old, just $40. What can that $40 become over your lifetime? And I take you step by step by step through the process. No false promises, but no way to know what the future will bring. The bottom line is, I mean, that can be $200,000 return, $200,000 for $40 done Con- conservatively, not being aggressive, conservatively. So you start early. I use in one of my presentations the implications of a dollar a day from the day a child is born until they're 65. At 10% a year, that's what the S&P 500 has, has given for over 90 years. It grows to about $1.8 million. Now that's in a Roth IRA. I don't know if you have the equivalent of a Roth IRA, but nothing like that. Huh? Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but tax-free forever. Tax-free is growing, tax-free when you take it out. Then if you waited for 10 years, 10 years to start taking it out, it goes down about a million dollars. Three thousand six hundred and fifty dollars you missed those first 10 years whack there's a million gone right there if you wait until you're 21 it goes down to something like 200 and some thousand dollars another half a million is gone because you didn't start 
early. So the other thing, this is this is pretty obvious. This is, in fact, this is probably one of the best pieces of news I'm going to share in this interview. If you start early and the first years are like 1965 through 1999, those were five years the S&P 500 compounded at over 28% a year. If you had been there, if you invested then rather than waiting until 2000, you had the benefit of that huge unknown. Who would have known? Nobody knew. On the other hand, something really bad could happen, and that would be great. I mean, this is the part that young people often don't realize. Like, remember 1929 through 1938, huge losses in the market. If you had put your money into small cap value, something we'll hopefully talk about for a few minutes today, but if you put it into small cap value, then you would have lost about 60% of your money at the end of 10 years. That's if you put it in on day one. But if you were dollar cost averaging in like young people are supposed to be doing, you ended the period with a 60% total gain. And that's because you were investing during the bad times. Young people are are ahead if they can buy these great asset classes cheap, but they're always afraid. Oh my God, I don't want to lose money. Well, you've already said it, Victor. The market is volatile one day at a time, but we're not living. This is about, talk about um, this idea of getting what you can right now. This is not about that. It's about forever. I mean, Warren Buffett said his favorite holding period is forever. Mr. Paul Maimon, uh, from a risk standpoint, if you have um, uh, you have mentioned uh, in your book about dollar cost averaging and uh, lump sum investing, and uh, I wanted to ask you if you were to choose between these options, um, dollar cost averaging versus lump sum investing versus yeah. buying the deep or market timing strategy, which would be your uh, best uh, choice? if you have received an inheritance today. Because ah, you said in your okay. book that a dollar cost averaging can turn a losing investment into a winning one. It's really tough, Victor. One of the weaknesses of my work is that I'm trying to give answers that would probably apply to a small percentage of your viewers and your listeners. I don't mean it's not solid advice. But the answer on these kinds of questions, so often uh, the answer should be, it depends. Because if somebody inherits uh, $100,000 and, uh, and they're not sure what to do with it, well, I'd want to be digging in. What, what have you put aside for your retirement? And, and, and when do you want to retire? And what's your risk tolerance? What's your experience with investing up to this point? Because I'm going to find out if you're the kind of person that historically has been sucked in to big bull markets only to find the ground fall out from beneath you like in, 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 in 2000 and in 2008. I mean, huge losses. And, and that changed people's commitment to investing for the rest of their life in many cases. Or in some cases, they get out and they stay out until... FOMO sets in, fear of missing out. And, and, and so they get in at high again, and then it goes down again. And you say, are they crazy? No, they're not crazy. It's just that, that when it comes to, to sex and food and money and a lot of important things like death as well, these are not intellectual decisions. These are emotional things we're tied up with. And so an advisor, and I used to be one, you have to dig and find out. Tell me a, a, about yourself, because for a lot of people, even though all the studies show that lump sum comes out ahead in the future. But let me tell you where those studies come out of. They definitely come out of Wall Street, because if I can convince you that you should put that money to work right now instead of dollar cost averaging in, 
I make the sale, I get the commission now, not over 10 years and or whatever. And, and, and then you just wait to find out whether that person's going to have the staying power. In many cases, what I did, because there's a case for lump sum, there's a case for a shorter term dollar cost averaging, and there's a case for a longer term dollar cost averaging. And there's a case for the point that if you start dollar cost averaging and the market goes down, maybe the dip is 20%, maybe the dip is 30%, but at the point that it drops that far with that body of money, you're in. That's your commitment. Now, what about having a third lump sum, a third over 12 months, dollar cost average, a third over 24 months? If that gives the investor the peace of mind and the commitment to fulfill the longer term thing we're trying to accomplish, that's the right way. But there is no perfect answer. The perfect answer is for me to know the future. Well, I often do a piece about what you know. There's what you know you know. There's what you know you don't know. Well, what I know I don't know is the future. And anybody who ever pretends to know, oh, Bitcoin, it's going, it's going up another 100000 or up $100,000. Sure it is. But I've had, heard other people say it's not worth anything. They're right. I mean, you can, you can find somebody to justify almost anything. But there's what you know you know, what you know you don't know, what you don't know you don't know. And the problem is what you don't know you don't know. You have no, you have no idea what that is because you don't know what it is. But it's a risk you're going to lose. I can tell you that. Then there's what you know you know but you don't do anything about it. And then finally, there's what you know you know, but you're absolutely wrong. Because what you know is simply a myth. And there are so many myths of investing that don't take into consideration the individual investor. It misses what good investing is about because it's you as an individual investor that is more important than my asset allocation, than Victor's asset allocation, than anybody's asset allocation. You are the mystery, not the market. To be honest, Paul, I thought about this blend strategy of having one third in lump sum, one third in dollar cost average, and one third buying the dip when there is a huge dip. Uh, That's I also great wanted to ask you because you have recently said in a podcast with Ben Felix that you have been a market timer. Do you think that market timing, which has higher value at risk, but lower expected returns, should still be suitable for those conservative investors who want to avoid painful drawdowns? Or do you think that from an emotional standpoint, the best uh, idea would be to still the best compromise to do dollar cost averaging? Aha, uh -huh. now we're talking emotions, huh? Well, I can tell you without any question, the best emotional decision is do not use market timing. I honestly don't know any more difficult strategy than market timing. Buy and hold, if you do it right, you were supposed to identify what your risk tolerance is, how much you're willing to lose to stay the course. That's part of the process. You establish that, and you've already said, this is how much I'm willing to lose. And so if you put enough bonds in the portfolio, you can stabilize, that's the break, if you will, the amount of gas you're putting on, and that's the stock position that you have. And that gas and break combination is what is to keep you in there because we don't want you to lose more than you're willing to lose. And I have found most people, once they really get it, are able to st stay the course. They have to trust the market for the long term. But I believe most people can. Market timing, it is a nightmare because any good market timing system is going to be trying to protect against major market losses. So when the market starts down, 
and you get out, you do the market timing, and you go into something that isn't making much money, maybe isn't making any money, you just don't want to lose any more to the downside. But then, it's not a miracle that the market turns around maybe the day after you sell out and goes back up. And now the market timing system says proudly, it's time to buy. <laughs> and then, oh, okay, that means I used to have X number of shares when I last sold. Now when I buy, I have X minus shares because the shares are costing more. What idiot wants to do that, they ask themselves. And the market timer says, be patient, be patient. And then they get in. And you know what it does next? It goes back down and it causes this automatic sell signal. It is not made for individual investors because it requires too many regrets. Read any textbook on the psychology of investing. And the one thing that we don't like to have is a regret. Human beings hate to have regrets. They don't like to admit they took a loss. They don't like to, to not only admit, but they don't like it about themselves. And then their spouse says, how are we doing, honey? Oh, we're not doing well. I, I don't want to talk about it because I've got regrets. Look, buy and hold has all sorts of risk. And buy and hold says you could be down 60%. 60% on the equity portion of your portfolio. If you're not willing to accept that, you either don't do it or you put enough bonds with it to bring it down to 20% or 15% loss. You can control that, but the minute you control that side, it means the return is going to be less. And that's what we're always trying to get the best return for unit of risk and market timing. Oh, I forgot to tell you. In a really great year with buy and hold, market timers stick, okay? Because they're built to be defensive, not to be aggressive. And yes, half of my portfolio is market timing, half is buy and hold. And for people who like the thought of leverage, a portion of my part that is in market timing combines leverage with market timing. And it turns out that has had the highest return since 1995 of any of the strategies that I've been involved with. So, yes, market timing can work, but emotionally, it's the pits, I promise. Mm, to eliminate, let's say, the emotional biases, uh, do you think that a momentum trend following strategy would be better than a buying and hold approach. It has proven to bring better risk adjusted returns, but it's not risk based. It's still based on emotions. Well, it, 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 well, it's measuring emotions in essence is what it's doing. And a lot of what my market timing, which is managed by somebody else, I don't do it. I don't have time. I'm a ret retired guy. And I'd rather do this than be looking at my portfolio and figuring out what to, to do next. Look, here's the challenge. Momentum systems are just fine. They are just as risky. If you're doing pure momentum where you're moving from asset class to asset class, and you're going to be in some sort of growth equity asset class more than likely, you're, you're not looking to go to cash. Now, maybe you are looking to go to cash along with a, a momentum with equity and sector types of, uh, uh, of, of portfolios. But you will have just as much risk uh, as an all equity portfolio, uh, particularly in an all equity momentum strategy. And you will have long periods. Here's the thing. We'll talk maybe again about small cap value. Yeah. One of the reasons small cap value doesn't work is because you historically would have to live through many 50, about 15, 15 year periods where you didn't do any better than the S&P 500. Well, imagine when you get all excited about value and then you get into it and then all of a sudden you're in that 
period where it's not that you didn't make money, you didn't get the premium that you thought you were going to get. And that just drives investors nuts. I could have made the same money in the S&P 500. Why did I take all this risk? That's part of the process. Why, by the way, I want small cap to be part of your portfolio, not all. Um, talking about uh, all equities portfolio, do you think that a young investor should be all in equities or keep some cash and bonds also? All equities, all the time until they're probably 40 years old. And I'm going to want to make sure that I don't sound like I'm encouraging people to take more risk than they should. Here's the thing about equities. The, I said this earlier, the best thing that can happen to you when you're investing in equities as a young person, and I consider 25, 35, and even 45, very young. So what do I know? I know that I'm not investing in one company. I'm investing in thousands of companies. So I'm not worried about one company not doing well. I know the market is going to be down and dirty from time to time. It's just part of the process. All I can say is it always has, and there's no reason to think that it won't be down 50% again. I have no idea when. Could be, could be in the, the NASDAQ could be in the process of doing that right now. How do we know? We don't know. So when the market is down, we want the opportunity to buy more, more of those great asset classes, not companies, asset classes. So, so that we're not stuck on depending on any one sector or any one individual company. I don't think that's a wise thing to do. If you have bonds in the portfolio, what it does for every 10% in bonds, the probability is over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it's going to reduce your return one half of 1% for every 10% in bonds. So you may think uh, that, that you're being smart by having some defense in your portfolio. I have a balanced portfolio, you might say. I have 10% or 20% in bonds, and I have 80% in equities. And then I would say, now, wait a minute. Do you have that 20% in bonds? because you want to defend against a bear market? And you'll proudly say, yes, that's a smart thing to do. Have some to keep you from losing all that money. And then I showed them how much they're going to lose with 80% in equities. The bonds are not doing that, their job. I mean, you think they're going to help, but they help a little bit. But what they do is they also penalize the investor because they don't allow the investor with that 20% they have in bonds to pick up more of those cheap shares. So when I talk about getting 10% in the S&P 500 and 12% and, and, and in small cap value, I am talking about being able to stay the course because the minute you start either market timing or adding bonds, you're putting on the brakes. And so I don't expect you'll get the 10 or 12. And of course, all you have to do is look at the long-term return of bonds. There's no evidence that bonds have ever made enough to help you retire early, ever. They do fine last 20 years. Long-term government bonds in the U.S. have done better than the S&P 500. So, yes, there are long periods that that, in fact, happens, but not for the real long term, at least not in the past. Uh, I know that Larry Swedra once mentioned that uh, long-term treasury bonds in U.S. had a 40-year period when they outperformed large-cap growth stocks. So, yeah. it can yeah, happen. Yeah, I mean... It can happen, and, and some people, by the way, I've heard this so many times, if I'm investing, let me recommend you get out. People, a lot of people think that whatever they're doing, that people should be doing just the opposite. That's a, that's a bad attitude to go in with. But some people do feel defeated because every time they do what lots of people are telling them, it turns out badly. And, and, and so it's, it, it's just the, 
Human Nature. One of my favorite books is Your Money and Your Brain by Larry by uh, Jason Zweig. And it's about the psychology of money and investing. And you will understand not only why you might be a little bit crazy, but why all of us are not just a little bit crazy, but most of us are a whole bunch crazy because we believe things that just aren't so, but it feels inside like they are. And the reason I like mechanical, dollar cost average, index funds, all these things that kind of ask you, please don't think about this. Don't feel your investments. Just maintain these, these very disciplined, tough, minded investment strategies and your odds of success go way up. And if you say, well, how do I know so much? The fact is I'm talking about the past. And if I don't leave you with anything more memorable than this, I'll be surprised. There is no risk in the past. We always know what we should have done. And that gets us in trouble because we look back and we think, ah, I should have known that. It was so obvious. Sorry, Victor, I, it's early in the day here and I'm just full of energy. Oh, that's perfect. I have a lot of more questions for you. Prepared. Okay, all right. For Let's instance, discussing about costs, we all know that John Bogle, uh, who was the uh, father of index investing, was saying that costs matter a lot in investing. And he was recommending index fund for this purpose of lowering your costs. Uh, a lot of people only look for the lowest fees ETFs. But there might be equity holdings with higher expected returns, which have also higher expense ratios. Should we approach costs on a relative or absolute basis? Well, let me make sure I've got this question right. Um, the, the, the question here is the focus on the asset class versus the expense. In other words, I mean, yeah. if somebody just focuses on expense, yeah. Does that mean that if I know where there is a bond fund that charges one one hundredth of one percent, I should move out of the S and P five hundred where I'm paying four one hundredths of one percent and get into bonds? Most people would say, "No, nah, that doesn't make any sense." I mean, after all, the return of the S and P five hundred; those are stocks. Those are supposed to make more money. Well, guess what? They have, but. The same should be said when somebody says, I want my money at four one hundredths of one percent, as opposed to in a small cap value fund, maybe pay 15 one hundredths of one percent or 20 one hundredths of one percent. I don't want to do that because the expenses are higher, they'll say. Well, then I say, look, here's what I know about the past. Again, my expertise is in what I can know. And so I know that what I'm about to tell you is good. Otherwise, I wouldn't tell you. You understand how that works in life. Okay, what I know. From 1928 to 2020, S&P 500, 10%. That's a great return. Large cap value. Now, S&P 500 is, in a way, mostly growth, but it's got some value in there as well, but mostly growth. But what if we get rid of those great growth companies and only own the large value companies? It's more risky because they aren't the, the, the best. So what do we expect when it's more risky? As long, as long as we're not in a penny stock environment, if we're in legitimate asset classes, 1% more. 1% more for large cap value than the, the large cap blend, the S&P 500. Well, in my book, what you'll read is that for every half a percent, that return that you get over your lifetime, between what you spend in retirement and what you leave to others, without having to, at least in the U.S., invest huge amounts of money, it's a million dollar plus decision every half a percent. And there's large cap value sitting there with an extra 1%. Hey, I, 
I want some of that in my portfolio, as well as the S&P 500. But I don't want to stop there. What about small cap blend, small cap companies that are partly growth and partly value? Small cap blend, also more expensive to manage than the S&P 500. That adds another 1%. I'm going back to 1928, and small cap value, even more risky, another 1%. So would I be horrified if somebody, in fact, for the first 20 years of their investment life, put it into small cap value? I would not be horrified. I would just be concerned. They'd be extremely disappointed for part of the time they hold it and would give up. But I would pay more. Now, remember, 10 versus 13. Let's just say that's the choice you have. I would be more than happy to pay an extra quarter of 1% a year to get the extra return. But if you don't believe it, you shouldn't do it because you don't want to give up money. In fact, you should never make an investment for which there is not an expected uh, premium. That is so important. People will want you to invest in things that there is no expected premium. Doesn't mean they won't make money, but you will have simply been paid for getting the risk. Anyway, that's a whole other topic unto itself, as you probably know, Victor. But that would be my answer to somebody who's worried about paying an extra one-tenth of 1% to pick up an extra one or two or maybe even 3% return. Okay, following the same approach as above with costs, what would you choose between a simple strategy of investing in one global index fund versus a more complex uh, strategy, um, which might bring a slightly higher expected return for the very long term, but in the same time might be more difficult to buy, hold, rebalance, and tax manage? Well, you know, you, you, you suggested a small additional return. Remember, an extra half a percent to me is not a small additional return. So I just want to make sure that we're using, that's called the half a percent extra return. Uh, am I, is it willing to put together a portfolio? Now, I think you know we have a four fund strategy that is large cap blend for one quarter, large cap value for another quarter, small cap blend for another quarter, and small cap value for the fourth quarter. You can get that all U.S. or you can get it U.S. and international. And I think you can come not, you can't do it exactly that way through the choices that you sent me, but you could catch most of it, I I do think, Victor. But is it worth the time and trouble to make that extra return? Well, when you start looking at it over a lifetime, and understanding. I mean, let me just turn it over for a second. I Somebody comes to my house and wants to sell me a load mutual fund. 5% right off the top. Oh, but only one time. You're going to get into this great mutual fund. And you're going to pay. Yes, you're going to pay something. But, you know, that's for me to bring it to you and recommend it to you. And I'll always be there if you want to call me and talk about it. Well, you know, that's sales pitch that you're going to get. Um, is it that 5% harmful long-term? It turns out, if that's an equity portfolio, that it's about a half a percent over your lifetime per year, a half a percent per year. We're talking a million dollars. That's why the title is We're Talking Millions. It's not because we're trying to blow this up into something bigger than it is. It's real if you make the right decisions. And so um, my view is, is that if you can live with it emotionally and you understand why these different asset classes are legitimate for the long term, then I think it is worth taking the time. Not so different. I don't know about in Romania, but I can tell you in the U.S., there's a website, bankrate.com. Bankrate.com allows me to go and find out where should I buy a CD right now and get the best five-year CD, one-year CD. And then they'll show you 
all sorts of bank di- and you, and you could see literally a half a percent difference between one CD and another CD, both of them guaranteed by the U.S. government to back the bank if it goes out of business, which means I have to bend over and pick the money off the ground. But off the ground means, oh, I got to go to another bank. I got to fill some paperwork out, you know, and, and I just, I'll just go back to my old bank. And they know you're that way, by the way. They're counting on you coming back to them. So is it worth bending over and picking the money up off the ground. For some, it is. For others, it isn't. Fantastic <laughs> comparison that you make. And that's even that's true in Romania. A lot of people choose the worst uh, interest rates because they simply don't care. I mean, it's incredible. Even yeah. though they that 1% can matter for someone who doesn't have a lot of returns because he doesn't invest. Uh, Mr. Paul Maimon, your uh, ultimate buy and hold portfolio aims to capture global market cap weightings, adding factor tilts without any geographical bets. Do you think that it is wrong for a young investor who can bear more risk to overweight undervalued regions like, for instance, emerging markets value equities, which should be the highest expected return asset for equities, since, as Larry Swedro mentioned, In an efficient market, all asset classes should have the same risk-adjusted return. Uh, this is a very tricky question because what happens, and to make sure that that what Larry is saying, and, and I agree, and I basically said it before, that additional return you get for large cap value is because it is more risky. Small cap land, more risky. Small cap value, even more risky. Emerging markets, even more risky. Small cap emerging markets, even more risky. And you can get uh, emerging market value. In fact, I think you have access to a, a value emerging market fund. But here's the part that maybe justifies the idea of not putting all your money in the most aggressive. What you get when you combine asset classes that don't go up and down together, look what's happening right now. Technology is falling apart. I mean, it could turn around by the time I get done with this interview and be going up again, but I don't know. On the other hand, value, excuse me, I noticed this morning, value is just doing great today. So it may be absolutely right that the expected return of each one of these asset classes is simply driven by the risk. But when you put them together, it lowers the overall volatility and it does take advantage of some of that additional return. Yes, you're giving up some advantage, but you're also, you, you're going to have to, if, if you've never shown your your uh, followers, the Callum tables. Uh, they, it's the periodic table that Callum puts out. Fascinating. It will show, uh, I think, maybe 10 or 15 uh, global asset classes, U.S. and international asset classes, one year at a time for over a 20-year period. It's a beautiful, colorful chart and uh, a graph. And And you'll see emerging markets bang at the top, move at the bottom, top, bottom, top, 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 bottom, bottom, bottom. I mean, it's all over the place. And that's fine for some people who truly understand what that all means. On the other hand, I am sure there are people right now who are concerned of what's going to happen in those emerging markets with the challenges of the coronavirus I mean, the pandemic may hurt those people at a whole other level. How are things in Romania right now out of Curia? I don't know. Do you, how are you doing? With pandemics? Yes. Not very good. <laughs> Not very well, but <laughs> we have a lot of debt and it is increasing. The public deficit is increasing. So I don't know what the and government could do. And that is the same problem, I think, that a lot of countries are having. And we don't know the outcome of that. So that may mean that down is a lot further down than people expected they were going to have to go. 
And for those people who have the, the commitment to see it through, my problem as a teacher is I'm teaching to the middle. And I'm an aggressive middle compared to John John Vogel or all these people who say, just put all your money in the total market index. I do not give up and say that. But I, on the other hand, I don't want to go all the way to the right where people will say, oh, Paul says it's okay. Yeah, it's okay if you want to lose most of what you got and can stay the course. And if you'll live a long time. <laughs> Mr. Paul Neyman, you have mentioned in one of your sound investing podcast episodes that just because an asset is uncorrelated, referring to gold, it doesn't mean that it has earned its place to be part of your portfolio uh, if it doesn't offer any positive real returns. Have you changed your view on gold given the increasing money supply and zero or even negative interest rates environment? Uh, no. I can tell you that. Now, I, uh, when somebody believes something, what they typically do is try to find somebody famous to, uh, uh, to, to, to back them up, okay? And if you got to, there's a thing, I, just a second here. I got a, there's an old quote. Uh-huh, here it is. Here it is. I'm going to read this, but I love it because okay. I, I could not memorize it. This is from Warren Buffett, one of my heroes, uh, not because of his track record, because his track record hadn't been very good the last 15 years, but because he does tell the truth, at least as far as I know, and uh, I like truth tellers. He says, if you took all the gold in the world, it would roughly make a cube 67 feet on a side. Now, for that same cube of gold, and this was written, I don't know, four or five years ago, it, could, it would be worth at today's market prices about $7 trillion. That's probably about a third of the value of all stocks in the United States. For $7 trillion, you could have all the farmland in the United States. You could have about seven Exxon Mobiles. You could have a trillion dollars of walking around money. And if you offered me the choice of looking at some 67-foot cube of gold and looking at it all day, and you know me touching it and fondling it occasionally, call me crazy, but I'll take the farmland and the Exxon Mobiles. Now, that's as an investment. What you may be talking about, Victor, is what about gold as the break? Remember, there's the gas and there's the break. So I have favored, not just because of Warren Buffett, but because when you look at gold, it's very volatile. Yeah. And it can be volatile to the, to the downside at the same time as the market is volatile to the downside. Call me crazy. But from my viewpoint, long-term government bonds. Now I'm talking U.S. here. I, yeah. I can't speak for every country. Long-term government bonds turn out, make the same long-term rate of return as gold approximately. But when the market decides to go south, like 2008, long-term government bonds were way up. And, and gold does not hold that up that well in the catastrophic. I, if I'm going to ask for the break, I don't want to be sitting there heading towards an accident, pumping the brake, trying to get it to work, and then wham, it doesn't work. I want the brake that's going to work. And I believe, I trust the government bonds better than gold. Which, unfortunately, is only U.S. long-term treasuries because... Other asset classes are not that uh, good for uh, uncorrelated returns. But yeah. even those bonds now will uh, generate negative uh, real returns, I, I believe. So going forward, we are at the end of the uh, long-term uh, uh, bull market in bonds uh, of 40 years. I think I'm struggling to understand whether they are still a good diversifier or not. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you asked that, Victor, because what actually 
Uh, to be fair, what we recommend, if you look at our portfolios, are short to intermediate only. Uh, they too, by the way, held up uh, well in 2008, not as well as long-term government bonds. But uh, yes, for the break, you're probably, because long-term bonds can be uh, hit if the interest rates uh, go up, uh, but but not like gold can be hit in a, in a really bad bear market for gold. So uh, yeah, short to intermediate. Now, somebody will say, why should I put money in bonds? I mean, they don't make any money. Well, the reason they are in my portfolio is not because I'm expecting them to make money. It's because I'm expecting them to do better than money market. And historically, if I have some intermediate and then short term, I even have some tips in the portfolio on our website, then I, I I'm, I'm not looking. I'm probably going to do better than a money market fund. I'm taking a little bit of risk, particularly when the, when it's a catastrophic event. Money market funds aren't going to skyrocket like bonds could. And so, no, I am not a big fan of long-term government bonds for the purpose of, of, of being able to protect against uh, short-term losses. But, but they're okay compared to gold. And cash can still be a good hedging for market downturns. At least in countries like Romania, where you take some currency risk if you go into other countries' treasuries. So, uh, yes, of course. And that's an interesting question that I have for you. Tell me how people feel about investing in things that are dollar-denominated, U.S. dollar-denominated. Uh, uh, are you, would you be concerned about that currency risk? Uh, I think if it's in equities, I wouldn't be because the equity risk premium will cover uh, all the currency risks in the long term. But with these low interest rates, if it's for treasuries, I would be very concerned. And I think even if you euro hedge your portfolio, you still pay something extra on that hedging. And also that you have some uh, expense ratios for these funds. What I'm doing in Romania is to combine cash in euro, uh, which is a better currency than our local currency. We are exposed to eurozone, of course, mm -hmm. with some local treasury bonds, which are also in euro and have a higher yield. Of course, they also have some credit risk, but as a risk reward uh, um, scenario, I think they are better than... Um, uh, foreign developed uh, bonds which uh, have negative yield to maturity and we have some tax advantages to it so oh. could be some yeah. uh, uh, of course they, they're not uh, uh, I, I don't think they are uh, uh, uncorrelated in uh, market downturns so wouldn't be uh, a protection uh, which would work in that case but you still get your principal let's say five yeah. years for intermediate term uh, bond issued by the Romanian government. So I think I'll get my money back. So somehow I feel safe about it. But once again, not an uncorrelated uh, asset class. And as Larry Sedo says, some of that yield is not only your return, but also the premium for default. So you have to uh, yes. uh, assess that yes. uh, risk. Yes. And, and the reason, if somebody looks at my portfolio, they would realize I don't really pretend to know about the future. Uh, I am a, an individual that has been afraid of the catastrophic all of my life. And so I am half US, half international equities. I am half large, half small equities. I am half value and half small blend and half large value and, and, and large uh, blend. And, uh, and, and I'm half buy and hold and, and half in, in timing. And in the buy and hold, I'm half in bonds. So if I knew anything, I wouldn't have all of these halves. By the way, I, I want to make sure that it doesn't sound like I'm adding all these halves up. It's, it's when you, uh, you look at half large versus half small. I mean, every one of those is a legitimate comparison. I just got the money spread everywhere 
that I know that it's a legitimate asset class and is likely to create a premium over time. And hopefully, my children and charities that matter to my wife and myself will benefit from us doing this and never exposing our money to a Bernie Madoff, never putting ourselves in a position of believing somebody's individual sales pitch. They're too good. They're just too good. And so I'm in index funds. If I, if, if I could be smart enough, I'd be in the best actively managed funds. But I have no way to know. And why should I believe any money manager when it turns out that the index funds over 15 years beat 90% of the actively managed funds that are run by smart people? I'm just hiding to protect myself from the crooks. I'm not sorry. I shouldn't call them crooks. Hi, I'm, I'm hiding from people who think they know more than they do, which includes me. I'm hiding from myself because if I started getting involved, it would be emotional. I would be right in there second guessing by the day what I should do next. I am protecting myself from me. It seems that you have a well-balanced portfolio. And uh, speaking about rebalancing, which is a powerful tool to reduce risk in investing, what rules would you use for it? Let's say purely discretionary, like once per year, or using a rebalancing table like Mr. Larry Swedro recommends? Uh, and also, how would you avoid generating uh, taxable events if you don't have an IRA account like U.S. investors have? Well, uh, for young people, I'm not all hung up on rebalancing. Uh, in fact, I think if there's any rebalancing to be done, it should be done with new money being invested. Uh, and, and the difference, when I look, for example, at the four asset classes going back to 1928, the big, the small, the value, et cetera, the, the difference in return is not huge by not rebalancing, yeah. but, but, it, but it does, um, and it does end up having more money in some of the more risky asset classes because they made more. When we get to be old, it's a different story. Uh, my, uh, us being 50-50 stocks and bonds, I don't want to be any more than that. I, I want to rebalance from time to time. And the people that manage my money have a very sophisticated strategy that they use. And I, I'm fine with it, but it's not something I'm going to try to get other people to do because uh, because it's a lot of work. Now, I like Larry Swedros. In fact, I don't know if I can find it right here. I wish I could. His latest book, I'd hold it up, about being a successful investor. It is terrific, and he has that rebalancing strategy in, uh, in that book. Um, I think it's just fine if somebody wants to try to do better. I am quite okay with once a year. Now, obviously, in a taxable account, that's a whole different story than in a tax-deferred or tax-free account, uh, where I think there are got to be more thoughtful in a taxable account. I, I, by the way, a lot of people don't know this, but when you look at actively managed mutual funds versus index funds, uh, there's about a 1% advantage in annual return just due to the different tax implications. Uh, you have to go kind of hunt around at Morningstar to be able to compare how an index fund does compared to the average actively managed fund. It's about 1% extra return for the S&P 500. Here again, I'm looking for a half a percent to change somebody's life, and they're putting a percent on the floor, again, on the ground for me to pick up. I wouldn't ever recommend an actively managed funds if, it were, if there were taxing, tax questions about, uh, about the returns. Mr. Paul Merrimom, I was impressed by William Bengen's paper on determining withdrawal rates using historical data. How probable do you think it is for the foreseeable future to use a 3% safe withdrawal rate if you have, let's say, at least 50% allocated in equities, 
And what if you have only 30% if you are more conservative? And when do you know uh, that you have enough to retire from working? Well, let me take the last one first. Yeah. Uh, it, I find that question um, uh, one of the truly most interesting questions because here again, when I was in the investment advisory business, I retired in 2012. Uh, the time that goes into understanding the needs of an investor, it, it, could, it could take three to six hours before any money is put to work uh, under the, the firm's uh, management. And that is because everybody's situation is different. You can talk about textbooks, and you, when you talk about textbook distributions, you can see Bengen's 4% and 3%. And, and, and in fact, he would agree with us that as you broaden the equity exposure in your portfolio, it allows you to take out more. Uh, I've done a couple of articles, uh, and I do them every year. One is on fixed distributions and the other is on variable, flexible distributions. My wife and I take out money on a flexible basis. Uh, it should last forever, whatever forever is. <laughs> but the reason being is that we are taking out 5% at the first of the year of whatever the value of the portfolio was the, at the end of the previous year. Now, it is absolutely amazing to see how well that strategy stands up compared to somebody who takes out 5% and adjusts it each year for inflation. I mean, it's, it's night and day. But when you're taking the flexible instead of the fixed, you ignore inflation, which means it's for people who are retiring with more money. So if you want to be flexible, I'm thinking you need to have one and a half times what you would likely have to retire with three or 4% using that kind of a distribution plus inflation. So there's a, there's a lot of moving parts. Now, I have some very exciting news from our end. Our job, we are a nonprofit organization. I get nothing. The, the, the two researchers that work with us, Chris Patterson and Daryl Balls, they get paid nothing. They are volunteering their time to, dump, to do some of the most amazing work for the people who follow uh, our, our studies. Uh, we, with the help of an amazing young man, are building calculators so that people can go into all of the tables. We have over 150 tables that you can dig into, different strategies, different combinations of U.S. and international value and growth, et cetera, going back to 1970. And you'll be able to plug in any whatever you got. I mean, these tables show starting with a million dollars. Well, what if you have... $821,000. Now you plug it in, you got the calculator, it goes through, rebuilds the tables to who you are. And you can start them from any time, 1970, 1985, 19, whatever. So we also have it set up so that you can look at 200 years of performance for different time periods. So by the time you use these, these calculators, you will have tested what I think you need to know, what will probably work, and you need to know with any strategy how low is low and how low can you go. I have warned a lot of people, you think you can start with a million and let it go down to 700,000 and still stay in the strategy when you're retired? Well, think again, buddy, because it's not going to happen because it's hard to find a spouse that likes that feeling. And So you look at, well, what if I had 50% in stocks and 50% in bonds? How would my spouse, male or female, feel about that? Differently, I can tell you. And you'll see it in the table. So 
I don't have a perfect answer for for you, Victor, but we're working on it to make it fun for people to test their situation. And by the way, this is why buying the dip is so risky because there are infinite scenarios uh, from a higher point where you can get minus 5%, minus 5%, minus 5%. And there are financial educators in Romania who actually recommend people to buy at each minus 5% decrease of the market. And people can take too much risk if, if this is more than their risk profile, let's say. So I believe this is why your strategy works and works forever because there are infinite scenarios for which uh, you can get minus 5%, minus 5%. And by having this 5% withdrawal rate from a new amount, basically your portfolio will never reach zero. But of course, um, it can, you can reduce in absolute terms lower amounts if the market continues yeah. to go down. So yeah, it's a risk you, of future people, consumption. It, it, it is a challenge because every strategy has a weakness and it's easy to find the weakness. I don't care whether it's buy and hold or timing or, or, or dollar cost averaging or lump sum, they all have a weakness and that weakness has a probability of happening. Can't always tell you exactly what that probability is, but I can tell you for a lot of you, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be happy or 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 satisfied or relaxed with that that probability. So it's it's a uh, that's why if I can get somebody to get into an index fund where they're likely to be in the top ten percent over fifteen years. And, and that isn't even very long, by the way. And the longer the period it is, the fewer the funds that are going to be in that, uh, in that top 10%. Their probability of success is better than most investors, even though they're never going to be in the hot fund. Never. And, and that's a lot to give up for some people. But if you can end up in the top 10%, I'm thinking that's reason for a celebration for most of us. Uh, I don't end up in the top 10% almost anywhere in my life anymore. I'm not, I can't run as fast. I can't swim as fast. I can't think as fast. If I could just know that my money is in the top 10%, I'm thinking I'm doing well at my age. Mr. Paul, I have two more questions uh, related to one is them related to dollar cost averaging and the other to mm -hmm. retirement. Uh, so in your latest book, We're talking millions, 12 ways to supercharge your retirement. You say that dollar cost averaging will guarantee that your cost for the shares you own will be lower than the average of all the prices you pay. Can you explain us why this happens? And also, which are the odds for this strategy to underperform land sum investing for 10 years? Well, okay, now I'll answer one of them. By the time I'm done with the answer, I may have forgotten the first one, but I'm <laughs> going to answer the second one first, okay? Sure. Okay, how does dollar cost averaging not work out versus lump sum? Uh, well, as I said, there is a, there is a, there is a situation where that is, is very possible. For example, a person, let's say that they uh, inherited $100,000. And they decide to dollar cost average in over 10 years. Yeah. $10,000 a year. Let's say for the first nine years, they get uh, 10%. And then in the 10th uh, year, they get a negative 50. We know from 2000 to 2009, there were two bear markets of a loss of 50%. So it's just not like it would be a miracle if this happened. Um, now you compare that, now that, that would be a lump sum. By the way, if you did that with a lump sum, before I do dollar cost averaging, I think you end up with like $135,000. If you dollar cost average $10,000 a year, Yeah. you would end up with about 72,500. And this is the problem with dollar cost averaging. Because you took all the loss and only a part of the gains, right? For yes, exactly. Thank you for, that's, I should have said that. You're right. 
And so sometimes if somebody says, I want a dollar cost average in over 12 months or 24 months, I'll say that's fine. But understand this, it is possible that over the 12 months, you will be buying in ever uh, rising markets. Yeah. You finish it. You congratulate yourself for having gotten in without, without panicking. You're all in. Then the market takes a nosedive. Um, it's you. You never. You can. You cannot eliminate the risk. risk. You postpone it and, in the, into the future. Yes, and that's right. And I do think that's the reason why I encourage people as they can to oversave, because I don't know what bad thing is going to happen to you. Uh -huh. And I would love for somebody to say. In 50 years, there was this old guy that said it was imperative to oversave. So we decided to do that. And now we're okay because if we hadn't oversaved, we wouldn't be there. And that's the business I'm in, trying to leave a, a, a crumb of knowledge that somehow will impact people over a lifetime. Uh, by the way, I want to share, because you have a lot of folks, I, I'll, I'll bet, who are uh, f fire people. Yeah. And and I ran into a young fellow lately. I, I, I want to share what he's doing, because I hadn't run into somebody who was doing this. He is a man who is absolutely committed to helping others with his talent. And when you use his talent in the world of nonprofits, you don't make much. Uh, you, make, you don't make enough that you can do any more than meet your basic cost of living. He's not able to save the way that he needs to save. He made, I just thought, the greatest decision. And it's so obvious and now that I hear it. He decided to leave what he really loved and do something, I, I don't know that he hates it, but he can't wait to get back to what he loves. He is going to do what he doesn't really like to do compared to what he loves for, money. for about five years. He's a young person putting away enough money that that money will be enough if it's just left to grow 30, 40 years out that it will supply him the income that he will need that he would not have otherwise had. And if by chance it's not quite enough because he loves what he's doing, he can keep on working. And in a sense, it's what I did as I thought about it because I didn't have to retire but what I really loved doing in all the years I was building my business, I loved teaching. And so I retired, and now I work just as many hours in the day. I, I was up about 4 o'clock this morning, kind of thinking about this conversation we're having today. And I'll be working on it until 6 o'clock tonight, other things that I'm trying to do to help others. If I had to go back to work because I took these eight, nine years now without any income, I'd be happy to go back to work if I had to because I got to do what I wanted to do. But in his case, he's saving all that money back now when he's young, but not for very long because he really wants to get back to where he's adding value in the world. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's a wonderful mindset. I don't mean that people who don't have that mindset are, are wonderful, but I love that commitment to helping others. You got it too, Victor. You do. You know, it's 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 wonderful, and 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 I I envy your youth. I I don't envy the fact. Well, I guess I I envy the fact that if you do your job, there's a whole bunch of people there that you can help because. Not enough of them have found their way. So. For sure. Most of them. In Romania, 99% of people don't know about money, 
which is incredible because you go to school for so many years and learn about all the nonsense in the world, but don't care about what is most important in your life because yeah. we like it or not, money affects our life. So why do you go to the to job and uh, get a salary if you don't know what to do with money? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And as you well, said... We, by the way, we only have a few, five states in the United States require a class on personal finance in high school, five states. And, and I'll tell you, if the banks wanted young people to understand money, they would have lobbied the schools a long time ago. The best thing that has ever happened to the banks is that nobody educated, very few people got the education and it's not about being greedy avarice it's not about about piling up money it's about having enough and too many people will not have enough because nobody has simply taught them how to do it there are so many people and i'm sure this is true in romania victor yeah. so many people who think the stock market is just a big gamble yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, what do I know? Here's what I know about the past. The worst 40-year return for the S&P 500, the worst was an 8.9% compound rate of return. The best was 12.5. Well, if you look at the worst year, yeah, you would have lost half of your money. But this is not about a year. When I started my business with $15,000, plus a loan. Uh, I didn't think about it as one year. That would have been idiotic because that would have been crazy. I didn't make any money the first year. I really didn't make any money for five years. And, 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 and that's the nature of getting started. And I wish I, there's a table I would love. In fact, I'll send it to you. Sure. Uh, an art, an article about about putting money in a little bit at a time. And what I want people to see is that in this particular table, it assumes you're saving $1,000 a year over 51 years. It shows at the end of each year what you were worth in the S&P 500. At the end of the first year, you put in a thousand. The profit was $22. 22. And somebody told you this is the thing you should do to build a million dollar account. And that's because you cannot, if you think about it, one year at a time, you're sunk, you're lost. But by the time you go out 10 years, guess where most of the profit came from? It came from the money you put in. And that's the way long-term investing works. The early years, you are the hero, not the stock market. But then all of a sudden, you've got enough in there that it is the stock market that's making you look good because it's making so much that it's many times what you're putting in. And yeah, you might stop putting it in at some point because you think you're way ahead of the game. I hope you don't because you never know. But it is that those you asked earlier about those early years. You are the champion, the hero of the early years, not the stock market. And then the stock market becomes the champion. Yes. But what intrigues me, Paul, is that uh, people discuss about stock market as being gambling but they don't want to learn to invest in index funds, which are basically a tool for diversifying risk. As Larry Swedrow says, you don't run away from risk, you diversify it. And they yeah. prefer to gamble in individual stocks, uh, Bitcoin, yeah. and these things which have huge uh, idiosyncratic, uncompensated risks yep. and are basically a tool for gambling. So I don't understand if they are afraid of this, uh, of the stock market. Why are the... What are they doing in such um, unfiduciary way? Well, I will tell you why they're doing it, and this is a shame, but this is why they're doing it. It's because people who care more about themselves 
than about the investor are selling them these things yeah. and not and not stopping them and saying, look, you know, it's fine that you're doing, but maybe you do that later when you when you built the foundation. But why don't you come back and talk to me in 10 years? Oh, no, 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 no. I need your money now, now. And so what are they what what is it about the index fund? Well, here's the bad news about the index fund. Basically, it's the way really rich people invest. And I think a lot of young people will they just they can't think of themselves as being rich. Yeah. They think that rich people get there fast. And a few do. I mean, I think about the the people that 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 did the Doge coin, you know. Doge I mean, coin? that's this is the, it's called the Doge coin. I think it's a uh, cryptocurrency, right? It it's a it was a joke, and now it's worth somebody said thirty five billion dollars if you look at the value. And 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 of course, people people do win lotteries. It doesn't make any sense to buy a one dollar ticket. I mean, if you you're better off to put that into an index fund over 40 years than you are to buy a lottery ticket. But people see that as the only way they're ever going to be like those rich people. Those rich people, I, I'll never get there. Well, you can get there. I'm not a rich person, but I've got more than I need, certainly enough. And, and most people, well, by the way, you can always marry somebody rich. <laughs> Um, and, and that's another way to do it. Um, that may be more likely than taking all the time to figure out Bitcoin. But, but the, the bottom line is slow and steady. This is why I'm not a great fan of Robert Kiyosaki. He's not kind to mutual funds. At least when I read him, he wasn't kind about investing in mutual funds. Made people kind of feel like a dope. Well, when you read the rest of the history of Robert Kiyosaki, he writes a great book and motivates people to do things. And I can't argue with that. Uh, I would love to have the number of books in people's hands that he does. But yeah. the bottom line is that most, those books are for selling. Yeah. They're not for reading. That's how I feel about it. And I know I'll get hate mail for that, but uh, you know, I'm too old to, to try to, uh, to pussyfoot around these topics. But you know something? What happens? And here's what I like about this conversation, Victor. There are five people out there because of this conversation whose lives will be changed. You don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. They will get the free PDF at, at, at your site and all. They'll read it. Maybe they put one of the 12 to work. Maybe they'll put two. If they put eight of them. Wow. I think that would be great. But our conversation will change some lives. And that is why I am so happy to be here. I would never have a chance to talk to the 1% potentially of folks in Romania. And thank you for asking. Uh, I I'm, I'm really am happy to be here. And I hope we talk again in the future, if I can be of any help. Okay. Sure, Paul. It was a great time having you with us today. And uh, I appreciate very much uh, that you have been in our podcast. You are a very wise man and very humble. And uh, I enjoy that uh, you want to teach others how to stay the course. Because as John Bogle once said, I've said stay the course 1000 times and I meant it every time. And I'll end with this quote from... Uh, a legendary investor from Walk Tree Capital, Hormax, invest, you must. Now, uh, final last words are yours, Paul Merriman. Well, I, I will, since you brought up John Bogle, uh, I will share that I had the great fortune of spending 90 minutes with him about three years ago, I guess almost four years ago. Uh, it changed my life uh, because... It, it, it made me realize that uh, the things I was recommending to people were too complex. And, and they were the things that we have done for our clients for 
uh, at that time, uh, well, now 40 years, my old clients and my, my old firm is still there. They're, uh, they're still taking care. In fact, they're taking care of our money as well. But uh, he was right. Asking people to do it the way that we did it professionally was too much. And uh, with the help of Chris Patterson and Daryl Balls, we have worked hard since 2016 and 2017 to make it simpler and, and to try to help people who really would like to be able to set it and forget it as much as they possibly can. So I, I hope that people will continue following your work. We have a website. I would love it if they went to paulmerriman.com and followed our work. And both Victor and myself, I know, would love it if you had the ability to send other people to our sites, because when you're in the job of teaching and you love teaching, you want more. It's like an addiction. I want more. And I know in my heart, Victor wants more. Please feed our addiction and all the best to all of you. I do wish you all the best luck. And, uh, and good investing. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I wish you to enjoy your retirement years and continue <laughs> doing what you're doing. You're doing a wonderful job for all of us. I have discovered you by watching your uh, Sound Investing podcast, which was great uh, uh, resource, even though we don't have access to all those instruments in Romania, uh, because we have you cheats versions here for ETFs. But you're doing a wonderful uh, job for us all. Thank you. And um, I'm wishing you to have a great day, a great year. Stay healthy and uh, wish you all the best. Bye-bye, Paul. All the best. Bye-bye.